For years, I've been telling manufacturers, look, I don't really see the difference between a monitor and a TV. And it's driven me especially crazy when within one company, like say for example, LG, they have completely different technologies that they're using for the different product lines. I mean, we're at the point now where a big monitor is already the size of like a couple generations ago TV anyway. Well, it looks like LG's TV division finally got the message. And ever since they first unveiled the C10 48 inch OLED TV, they've been kind of quietly marketing it as a gaming slash productivity monitor. So today we're gonna see if that actually holds up. The YubiKey from YubiCo is a cost-effective and easy-to-use two-factor authentication solution. Learn more below and stay tuned for more later in this video. The first time I saw someone use a TV as a monitor was probably in the mid-2000s at a LAN party. The guy hauled it all the way there because he was like, guys, you're not going to believe this. It's the greatest gaming experience ever. It's so immersive. Meanwhile, I'm looking at it going, unless I was sitting this far away from it, that looks like hot garbage, dude, because it was running at 1366 by 768. Well, that problem is behind us. If you look at these marks on the floor, we've got the location of the TV, a couple of optimal viewing distances, sort of specifying how much of your field of view cinematic content should take up. And then perhaps most importantly, this visual acuity distance. This is the marker for where I should be able to sit to not be able to make out any individual pixels on the display. Because the C1048 inch is 4K, I can actually sit this close to it and this is theoretical, but I can't make out any of the pixels. Yeah, I mean, this looks, <laughs> looks freaking awesome. So does it hold up when we get this close? You know what's funny? Because the display is so large, I may actually be significantly further away from the corners than I am from the center. Distance from the screen itself is about 20 inches. Distance from the corner, if I was to read the text on Recycle Bin, 29 inches. So uh, if I'm looking over there, it's, Retina, and if I'm looking here, it's not quite, I guess. This was one of the bigger issues with those older low resolution displays. While you could make up some of the low pixel density with, you know, anti-aliasing or, you know, squinting a little bit, if you were trying to read text and use it for actual productivity, it was unbearable. This, on the other hand, looks great. I mean, I daily drove a 1440p 27 inch class display until not that long ago, and I've always felt that that was my good enough point, and this is better than that. Of course, one of the advantages that monitors have enjoyed until recently is higher refresh rate support due to the superior bandwidth of DisplayPort 1.4 versus HDMI 2.0. Of course, that changes if you've got an RTX 3000 series graphics card and an HDMI 2.1 monitor like this one. So we can jump all the way down to 4K, 120 Hertz, and get that high refresh rate smoothness without dealing with the weird color fringing on text and fine details that you would get with chroma subsampling. Of course, there's far more to the gaming experience than just refresh rate. And that's where things get really interesting here. Now, your eyes actually have a natural amount of motion blur. So even if these pixels were flipping instantly, I would still see this image as blurry, which is why we recently got our hands on dun, 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 a high speed camera. Check this out. This is this TV, the C1048 inch, versus a 360 hertz gaming monitor using a fast IPS panel from ASUS. So this is at 60 hertz to level the playing field, 1000 frames per second. OLED on the left, IPS on the right. Here's the start of the transition. It is complete in three to four frames. The first thing that happens is this leading edge dark spot actually disappears. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10? When's it actually done? That is so much longer, even on a top tier gaming IPS. Another cool thing the high speed camera shows us is how displays refresh from top to bottom. So check this out. One, so this is where the top one actually starts, but you can see this one's changing, the bottom one's not. Two, this one starts to change. Three, 
and somehow they're all done on the OLED. That is incredible. Next, we took it up a notch and ran our high-speed camera at 3,000 frames per second. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow. While it does take anywhere from like two to three milliseconds, what's cool about it is that it's still really clean. The bulk of the transition actually happens over like less than a millisecond. That is really incredible. Okay, so one, two, it's mostly done. Three, four, it cleans up the edges back here. That's it. We can even see the difference between the display refreshing here and here at this speed. We can see these dots come in before the uh, UFO starts to move. One, two. 20. So that's closer to like six milliseconds by the time I would say the image is pretty much transitioned. So what's crazy is on the LCD, you actually have a period of time where you're seeing a full double image that's longer than the period of time the OLED takes to completely switch the pixels. No wonder we wanted OLEDs on gaming monitors ages ago. I've been bugging LG about this for years. Of course, that's not to say that OLED has every advantage when it comes to gaming these days. LCD displays can go up to 240 or even 360 hertz. And what we can see when we look at our 3000 frame per second footage here is that when our LCD is getting these much more rapid updates, the motion actually does appear smoother, even though the image might not be quite as sharp. Let's step all the way up to 360 hertz, and we can see that the effect is much more pronounced. That ends up looking smoother overall than this. And of course, there's the elephant in the room, burn-in. Now I'm not gonna try and scare you, but I'm also not gonna try and reassure you. There are mitigation strategies that panel manufacturers are using. For example, shifting the pixels ever so suddenly, running a kind of refresher on the display that helps to clean it up, uh, dimming static objects on the screen, that's something that you can adjust to be more or less aggressive, and of course, just not running your display at full brightness. That's like half the battle right there. The brighter you run it, the faster the pixels will degrade. But in spite of all that, you probably will experience some burn-in under some use case scenarios. So go check out the comprehensive video that Artings did on the subject where they actually ran a bunch of OLEDs for like, what, a year? Something like that? To see how it affected them. And then you can make your own decision. Of course, pixel response times are just one part of a smooth and responsive gaming experience. Equally, or maybe even more important, is the input lag of the display. So that's how long it takes to receive the signal from your PC or console or whatever else and actually output it to the panel. And for years, TVs had very poor input lag compared to monitors. How does this one stack up? Actually, great. Basically, it's imperceptible to me. And what helps is that it has an auto low latency mode that detects when it's... It feels great, and it's aided by its auto low latency mode, an HDMI 2.1 feature that detects when a gaming source like an Xbox or a PC is connected and flips it over to low latency mode. Of course, that raises the question, why did TVs have bad input lag in the first place? Wouldn't they want it to be good? Well, it's because TVs do far more processing on the image than the typical monitor would. And that's because TV manufacturers were more concerned with the cinematic experience than the gaming one. And we did notice that flipped into any display mode other than game mode, yeah, it ain't as good. It's a little mushier feeling for sure. Another benefit of an OLED TV compared to an LCD monitor is that you can make certain assumptions about how HDR will be implemented and how good the experience will be. With an LCD, you pretty much have to have multiple backlight zones in order to achieve a... With an LCD, you pretty much have to have multiple backlighting zones in order to achieve a convincing HDR effect. So with an OLED, well, at 4K anyway, it's kind of like having 12 million backlighting zones. Of course, first and third person games aren't the only ones that can benefit from a large immersive display. RTS players are able to take advantage of being able to see much more of the map at one time. Assuming, of course, that the game developer properly implements higher zoom levels and that you've got a PC that can handle that 
and of course that you don't mind actually physically turning your head in order to see the UI elements. So okay, the ergonomics of a solution like this, they're not perfect, but at least they're making progress. I mean, one thing that really stands out as in need of improvement for this one is LG's kind of like buttock hump that they've got coming off of the back of the TV. LG's buttock hump back here is actually the reason that even though my desk is deep enough, I had to sit closer to the TV in order to reach my keyboard and mouse than the retina distance. IO is another thing TVs have traditionally done better than monitors. We've got four HDMI ports, all of which, just have a look here, yep, support 4K at up to 120 hertz. And even though there was that whole scandal with LG C9s supporting 48 gigabit per second HDMI and the C10s dropping that to 40, it looks like the bug that they had where there was chroma subsampling at 4K 120 on these C10s has been dealt with in a patch and you're able to get 444, so that's HDR 10 bit at 120 hertz 4K now. That means that if you wanted to hook up a next gen console as well as your PC, you'd be able to enjoy the full 4K 120 hertz experience that you'll be able to get in select titles. Make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss our video where we're gonna be checking out next gen Xbox series games on the LG C10. The last question to answer then, assuming that you don't mind the ergonomic challenges of having a TV on your desk or mounted to the wall behind it, is one of value. At around 1500 US dollars, it's priced right up there with the top tier ultra wide and large format gaming displays and it does have some inconveniences compared to a traditional monitor. One being that game mode just plain ain't as color accurate as filmmaker mode even here on the same display. So if you wanted to use it for something other than gaming, like say for example photo or video editing, you'd have to choose between a more responsive experience with your mouse not kind of feeling like it's floating around behind your arm actions, or having color accuracy. The only question left for me to answer then is, do I swap out the 38 inch ultra wide that's on my desk now with one of these? I've heard the argument made that you could just take a regular 16 by nine format display and if you want the ultra wide experience, well, just set a custom resolution and have black bars at the top and the bottom, why not? And especially with an OLED, you don't get that annoying glow that you would with an LCD, so, <laughs> That use case actually kind of sounds viable. And the pricing is actually better than the monitor. Gonna have to think about it. The YubiKey acts as a physical two-factor authentication device for hundreds of services like Gmail, YouTube, Twitter, Dropbox, password managers, and many more to help you protect your online accounts. There's no copying and pasting one-time codes. It's just a touch or tap on the key, and that's all that's needed to log in. It comes in many different form factors, so you can select the key that works best for you. Having a second key allows you to have a backup method in case you lose your primary key. I've actually experienced that one. And we've been using YubiKeys at Linus Media Group for years. We use the YubiKey 5 NFC, which has USB-A and NFC for use on mobile devices like phones. YubiKey also has a new key, the YubiKey 5C NFC, which has the same features, but with a USB Type-C port. I should actually get myself one of those. I don't have a Type-A port on my laptop anymore. So check them out today and use code LinusTech10 for $10 off any purchase at the link below. Thanks for watching. If you guys enjoyed this video, maybe check out our comparison between the Xbox One X and Xbox Series X running a selection of backwards compatible titles. It's, <laughs> this thing's kind of incredible. The loading times, they're like, 